Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Oblate School of Theology and the uh, Whitley Theological Center. I'm Scott Woodward. I'm the president here at OST. We're so glad to have you all here. Early this morning, all you brave souls, <laughs> I'm so very happy to be here with a good friend and colleague. I'll allow her to introduce herself. So, Addie Lorraine. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sister Addie Lorraine Walker. I'm a school sister of Notre Dame, SSND, and I'm here this morning by the grace of God. <laughs> I'm on sabbatical, and I do not get up this early. Well, I'm up, but not clothed, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and not talking to other humans. So this is a wonderful opportunity for me to realize that there's some getting up early in the future coming. So I'm very happy to be with you other brave souls here at uh, this event. Just a couple of uh, business items, just so folks know. Restrooms, out this door to the right, take a left, and you're there. Um, there's water, coffee, breakfast. It's legit to have cookies for breakfast if you're at a <laughs> church function, okay? <laughs> So you can have cookies for breakfast. Uh, that works. And yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask all of the panel members to come forward now and join us up here. Uh, So we are here at Oblate School of Theology. We are also here at the Sankofa Institute for African American Pastoral Leadership. And we are glad to be part of uh, hosting or this event. And part of is really what it really is because this is a collaborative effort sponsored by many people. And I would like to recognize those people at this time or those groups at this time. So if you are associated with any of the partners, I'm going to call your name and ask you to stand. And just, that's probably most of us in the room. Community of Churches for Social Action. Thank you. Compassionate San Antonio, City of San Antonio Faith-Based Initiative. There's <laughs> Ann back there. Compassionate San Antonio Grassroots. Remain standing, if you would. Uh, when I call you. Yes, but uh, somebody sat down that I called her name and I wanted her to remain standing. Uh, Feed San Antonio City Church and San Antonio Food Bank. HSS. I Can Interfaith Community Action Network. Remain standing if you don't mind, please. I'm, it's all, the list is not that lengthy, but <laughs> a little bit longer. I say Interfaith San Antonio Alliance, Jewish Community Relations Council, Jewish Federation of San Antonio, Oblate School of Theology. Okay, great. The Impact Guild. Sankofa Institute for African American Pastoral Leadership. We want to thank all of you. Thank you for hosting this. Thank you for bringing this conversation to life. Our time together will include some moments of conversation along with insights and storytelling from some of the men in Lionel's portraits. And we're gonna begin with a short table conversation to just allow you to get to know one another a bit. So, uh, Sister Addie. I'm known for table conversations, so I guess that's why they put my 
name against uh, that topic. But I would like for us to, to begin this conversation by asking ourselves a, a serious question. What started this event, which started about a year, more than a year ago, was Lionel Sosa walking in his neighborhood and he saw a poster that said, you can't be anti-racist unless you are actively anti-racist. That caught his attention. Something caught his attention, like a burning bush. So what is the burning bush for you with anti-racism? What is that? What does it mean for you? What causes you to stop and pause and even show up here at 7 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> so take a minute, just pause a minute. What is anti-racism for you? Perhaps you have to ask yourself, what actually is racism? What is it to live in someone else's skin? What is it to live in my skin? Just pause. What is anti-racism? And I would invite you to begin your conversation at your table. Just a, a quick, uh, brief introduction of yourselves and uh, kind of weigh in on the question. But if you would start with the person who thinks their age is closest to mine. Good morning, San Antonio. Um, it's good to have you with us today for this hybrid event. Uh, we're talking right now about what does anti-racism mean to us. So I invite you, uh, you might be alone, but there also might be somebody else in your, in your office with you or your home that you discuss with them. Um, what does anti-racism mean to you? Thanks for joining us in this hybrid event. My name is Ann Helmke. I'm the faith liaison with the city of San Antonio. Um, so wish you could be here with us, but so glad you are with us this morning. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
vice day chef. I'm an engineer, but you might see me in the interpret events as well, which is my passion. <laughs> and as Dan mentioned, you can be a racist intentionally or unintentionally. But if you know other people, then it's going to be easy to not be a racist unintentionally. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, this is why the gatherings are really important. To sit around the table, to just get to know each other, no agenda. No, you can't. My name is Shekhar Mahade also. I've been living in San Antonio almost like 18 years. So I'm represent, coming from the Hindu Swam Sevaksa. So here in the Hindu Swam Sevaksa, we are teaching the values to the next generation, like a family of values. And uh, we are trying to link to the other uh, people also, and then learn from them, and then how we all can come together and then be as a community. Our whole world is like one family. That's all one family. Yeah, we have a few minutes to meet one another and, uh, and uh, work towards an answer to our initial question there for discussion. That is the value we want to teach. We're so very fortunate this morning to have many of the subjects from Lionel's paintings, as you see, and those that were interviewed for the documentary that were a part of that, part of this process. We're very happy to have them here with us, and we have others as well on our panel here, and I want to give them the chance to say a bit about uh, their experience in this project, what it says, what it offers. Now, it says on the sheet here that each panelist is supposed to have two minutes. <laughs> now, I have been working here at Oblate School of Theology for 30 years. I know that if you tell a preacher he has two minutes, or a teacher that she has two minutes, that you are in fantasy land. But we're going to try to stick to two minutes. So think two minutes, and then if you take three or four, then that's OK. But <laughs> and I was not looking at Bishop Copeland when I said this, I promise. <laughs> Oh, uh, I'll introduce each one, and I want to start with someone on the panel that uh, I only met this morning, um, and very glad to have her here. Her name is Janine Cornelius, and the only description she off they offer to me on the sheet is that she is a mother, which sounds like a pretty important job. So. Uh, Ms. Cornelius, would you please come forward and offer us a few thoughts? Oh, okay. I didn't ex Thank you. I, I actually didn't expect to go first. I'm a, kind of a, I'll, um, but um, Sister Addie, this, this question you asked, what does anti-racism mean to you? Um, it's really a significant question because the root word of it, racism, you're absolutely right. You have to concentrate on that word and when you, you know, it, it, I struggled with, with the question because it's easy to say I am anti-racist. You know, that that's, flows off e anybody's tongue. Um, it's harder to say I am racist. It's harder to say, am I a racist? You know, and to think about maybe some of the things that we do um, that could be racist. Um, racism, is the oppressive acts against people of color, whether it's blatant or whether it's indirect. And because racism exists, it has affected African Americans, especially in unimaginable ways. You know, there's this, this cloud that, that we have we, as we leave our home, our homes, and it, it exists, you know, you don't know if you're gonna encounter it. Sometimes it's, you know, nebulous, 
Other times it's dark and cloudy. But um, to be quick, because I, I can be a talker, <laughs> um, to be anti-racist, you have to care about the subject of racism. And you have to start there. There's a young man that I know who, African-American young man, he has, he grew up with um, white students. He went to a Christian school. And when the incident with Ahmaud Arbery happened, uh, another African-American man who was gunned down, he tried to talk to his friends about it. And this is exactly what they did. They played the violin. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. And he's, you know, in his early 20s. And it was very upsetting to him. He went home. He didn't want to have them as friends anymore. And it was shocking because these are his, you know, his, his friends, you know. He, he hangs out with them, his bosom buddies. But that is how they felt. And it just goes to show how we really have to concentrate and, um, and make racism and eradicate it, you know, end it. The other thing I believe is we have to, to be anti-racist, we have to have the we mentality versus the them mentality. You know, we can't, it, it, racism in, in and of itself, it causes people to, to think irrationally and make in unintelligible decisions. They just do. You know, any, any racist act, it, it's, it's, it doesn't come from an intelligent mind. And we've got to get to the point where it's not socially, it's we versus them. You know, it's us versus them. We have to learn to be as one. Instead of seeing this, you know, you can see it. Um, we, we have to see color because we have to be able to celebrate the similarities and the differences. But, um, but we can't... Um, be negative towards someone. We can't judge them. We have to be able to respect each individual, see their worth, um, see their equality, see their kindness. I don't know if you all have ever seen that video. All of us here at one point were not affected by racism. And you know when that was? When we were little, really little. You know, you see that video of the, of the little African-American boy and the white boy, and they're running towards each other and they're two, three years old. And all they see is, that, you know, socially they wanna get together, they wanna play, they wanna, um, they may have a little argument now and then, but, but there's love there and there's a bond and they don't have that animosity yet. So something happens, something happens as we're growing up and we, we have to be able to fix that. Um, I'm gonna, I have more to say, but I'm gonna end it. So in, in the Bible, it says, thou shalt love thy lo the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And it doesn't just apply to loving God, it applies to us as individuals. Love thy neighbor as thyself is love each of us with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And if we can do that, then we can be anti-racist. And so, then we can, you know, that's it for now. <laughs> Thank you very much. The next member of the panel I will invite forward is someone that is uh, one of the men that was a part of this project. Uh, on my list, it says Brother Harold Williams, but I believe almost everyone knows him as, as uh, Reggie Williams. He's a member of Holy Redeemer Catholic Church and is a leader in that parish community, and we welcome him here to the podium. So. It's okay. Harold Williams, Reggie Williams. Yeah. <laughs> I am a Christian. I'm not a member of Holy Redeemer Church. Yeah. <laughs> but my, uh, my family, or my daughter and my two grandchildren, they're Catholic. Uh, I, I thought about how I wanted to start this. And I know I only got two minutes, but I decided that maybe this is the way 
I want to start it. I know you can stand failure, but can you handle success? I know you can stand to fail and keep on trying, but can you stand success and still stay sober? I know you can stand to put on sackcloth and still be prayerful, but can you put on broadcloth and still not lose the common touch? I know you can stand poverty and still be diligent, but can you stand prosperity and still be kind? I know you can stand to be educated and have common sense, but can you stand to be highly educated and still be humble and useful? I know you can stand to live in a shack and still be clean, but can you stand to live in a mansion and still thank God every day? I know you can stand to live in the ghetto and still keep your head held high, but can you stand to live in the suburbs and not forget where you come from or how you got there. These are words of Reverend Russell Fox. I was raised a Baptist, and as I look around and we talk about anti-racism, I see too many people that say they're Christians and they're carrying the flag of racism. Too many, and it's the biggest puzzle to me of how that can be. How can you talk about love as the basis for Christianity and still not love your neighbor? So anti-racism to me is very simple. Find all the people of goodwill. Find those people that actually believe in love. Find those people who are what they say they are, Christian. Gather them up and get them to speak up when they know wrong. I'm not advocating, you don't have to be violent, you don't have to cuss, you don't have to do anything, but you must speak up. We've got representatives from a variety of religious organizations here. If you sit in your chair and you hear racist comment and you say nothing, you're part of the problem. I'm part of the problem. We need people with goodwill and courage to speak up. I was mentioning that I had all these hopes as I grew up in a little town in Ohio. I had all of these hopes that my grandchildren would not have to face the same thing I had to face. Recently, that hope has been dimmed. So, that's about one minute and 30 seconds. <laughs> that's about one minute and 30 seconds. So, I'm just going to really give you some points real quick that, uh, <laughs> uh, one, racism has been here since the beginning. 400 years for black people, 519 since, the, since Europeans landed on this continent, called black people slaves, called the Native Americans savages.
How does it make you feel when you hate it before anybody knows you? Think about it. Not knowing the quality of services. We grow up every day not knowing the quality of services you're going to receive. Whether it's in the hair business <laughs> or what. You don't know when you go to the hospital what quality of service you're going to get. You don't know when you go to a restaurant if somebody's not doing something because they hate you. People of goodwill must, must have the courage to stand for. I spent 27 years in the Air Force. Like so many others, I thought that was going to buy my, <laughs> buy my acceptance. No. And then finally, I want to say that just because you're successful as a black person, as a Hispanic, as a Native American, as somebody, people will use that as an excuse to say, you, you weren't prejudiced against, you didn't experience racism. That has nothing to do with it. If you look at the bios of the people on these photos, on these portraits, there are successful people and every one of them has experienced, experienced racism. So anti-racism is just speaking up with courage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. And now, mea culpa, as we say, through my fault, Brother Harold Williams from Holy Redeemer. I'm glad to welcome him up. Thank you. Um, Anti-racism, um, as I look at it, uh, it's hard to uh, find the, I guess, find the right words to, to identify it. Well, you know, we all belong to a certain race. And the question is, um, you're born into that race. Um, and sometimes uh, I, I recall when, when, uh, when I was a teenager or, or a little younger, and I used to ask myself, I said, you know, well, uh, why is, you know, why is it that, you know, the whites have this, and we have that. Why are we less, and they have, and they are more? Uh, why is it different? And you ask God to say, "Well, you made me like this. You gave me this color. I didn't have a choice. You put me in this particular family. You put me in this particular town." around, you know, the community that I live in. And they treat me as they do. And so when I look at anti-racism, uh, it, it's really difficult to find all the words to identify or to explain First of all, you gotta understand that we belong to a certain race for whatever reason. It's how we look at other races. And the question is, do we look at them in a negative way or in a positive way? Or which way do we look at, at those particular other races? And I think that um, for me, um, to be anti-racism is to be poor people. Doesn't matter what race they belong to, <laughs> they're not your race. So that means that when you identify with the other, you're being anti-racist. Anti-racist, if you treat that person with that love 
um, and allow them to be who they are. God created variety. <laughs> he didn't say one, one race. That's what the beauty of our world and our community is that we have the variety, you know, and we all contribute and bring who we are to that particular variety. So um, we have to be, when I think of racism again, uh, anti-racism is like, how do I look at the other person? Can I step in their shoes and feel comfortable? You know, I was thinking the other day, I said, well, they talk about, you know, getting yourself um, at a certain point in terms of success. You pull yourself up by your bootstrap. <laughs> you know, you hear that line a lot, you know, how you got where you are. Well, you have to work hard and do this and do that, uh, whatever that particular thing was. Well, for people of color, uh, that's a heavy boot. That's a lot of carrying. That's a lot of lifting. And even when you get there, you still got problems. So um, I think as a people, um, as a community, as a world, that we need to be able to look at the other person as God created in a loving way, be able to put yourself in another position. And I, you know, uh, as a black man, I, I, you know, I often say, or think to myself, I say, well, what is it that I want from others? No matter what particular race you belong to, is that allow me to be me. You don't have to give me anything. Just allow me to be me. Don't put things in the way that will keep me from being who I am. Because in the process of trying to block me with whatever, whether it be political, economical, education, and so on and so on, there's so many different facets in our society which um, we can keep each other from being each other, from being ourselves, is that for me is you want to be anti-racism, look at yourself and look at me and allow me to be me, okay? Uh, there's a whole lot of ways that can happen. Um, and the spectrum is wide as, uh, you know, I, there are no w enough words to describe it because there's so many different ways that we, we interact with each other in our communities, in our world. So the line that I hold on to is anti-racism -raci is allowing the other to be who they are and whatever way that's possible. Uh, and we bring love to the picture. It's gotta be there. <laughs> you know, it's gotta be there. So um, with that, I, I leave you with um, just allow each other to be who God has created. Thank you, Mr. Williams. And now I would invite uh, Mr. Gordon Rogers, who's also a church volunteer, uh, to come forward and respond to the question. Good morning. Y'all can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Awesome. So what anti-racism means to me, um, simply put, it means to be proactively against racism. Um, like Mr. Rogers said, you have to call it out when you see it, um, following the see something, say something theory. Also, you have to acknowledge and check your own unconscious biases. 
I know that as an African queer male, male, when I walk into a room of people who don't necessarily look like me, I have my own unconscious bias and my own unconscious um, prejudices of what I think of the people that are there and what they may think of me. There's a song that says, um, I pray for you, you pray for me, and watch God change things. So really, that's what it's about, is looking beyond the person, seeing what they have to bring to the table, offering what you have to bring to the table, and eliminating any hate in the process. So let's lead with love. I'll keep mine short, but just lead with love, and let's change the world together, one mind at a time. I see different people of different faiths, different colors, and together you all just make a beautiful tapestry of what humankind is about. So um, thank you all for having us. Again, like I said, I'll keep it short. Um, but thank you for having us, and thank you for being a part of this journey. Again, let's be anti-racism. Anti-racism leads to anti-hate. Anti-hate leads to love. And again, let's change the world one mind at a time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now I get to introduce someone who really doesn't need an introduction. He's so very well known around San Antonio. Bishop David M. Copeland, a founding bishop of New Creation Christian Fellowship. He's been here at OST many times, and we welcome him back. Good morning. Um, John S. M. Beebe um, has said, I am because we are. We are because God is. I am because we are, and we are because God is. Um, in Cape Town, there was a community of mixed races, ethnics, and creeds. And one day, the government sent a bulldozer to clear that town. Everybody was getting along well, but someone or a group of people did not like it. The other day I told a story about a fellow who found out from God that he was going to come visit him that day. So the man, of course, cleaned up his house and got ready for this divine visitation. Cleaned his house, cooked a great meal, thought that the divine visitor was going to come around noon. So he prepared lunch at about 10.30 or so, there was a knock on the door, and uh, a Buddhist fella showed up. And the fella said, man, you, I, I don't have time for you. Don't have time for you. I've got this divine encounter that's going to take place real soon. He shooed the Buddhist fellow away. About 11.30, a Jewish guy showed up. And uh, he said, I really don't have time today for this. I'm expecting this divine visitor to show up. Nobody showed up at noon, nobody showed up at one, about 1.30, uh, there was this woman with a baby who needed some milk and some 
care. He said, I really don't have time for you because I, I know my divine visitor is coming soon and I don't want you to be in the way. So the day passed, uh, the dinner, the lunch got cold, um, the sun went down, and there was a knock on the door and there was this divine visitor. And the man said, you have disappointed me so much. I have cleaned my house and made a wonderful meal for you and have been looking for you all day. And I think it's very rude that you did not show up for lunch. And the divine visitor said, at 10.30, I showed up and you refused me entrance. At 11.30, I showed up. And late in the afternoon, I showed up. Somewhere I read, Addie, that what you do unto the least of these, you do also unto me. I will close by asking you to repeat after me, I am because we are. We are because God is. Thank you, Bishop Copeland. Now I invite uh, Ms. Sawana Balu, who is a community volunteer and mother, that uh, invite her to come and respond to the question. Good morning. Good morning. So I come to you as a mother and a community activist um, and as someone who is here to teach our children. He said, two minutes, I'm going to try my best. <laughs> I will try my best to keep it to that. To me, anti-racism is straight from the Bible. It's to love unconditionally. In the Bible, it says that we have a command from God, and after every command is a promise. And the command is to love thy neighbor. And that's not just the neighbor who lives next door, but that's the neighbor in other countries. That's the neighbor in other cultures. That's all of our neighbors. And although I've been born in this, this skin, that I'm in, I am commanded to love my brothers and sisters. And the way that I can stop racism when my young men, my sons go out into this world and my daughters go into this world is to teach the children not to have those biases. To teach them to love unconditionally no matter the color of their skin, no matter their culture, no matter their religion, extend yourself. Extend yourself to your neighbors. And it's often uncomfortable. I know y'all think I'm the social butterfly. That's, I'm just all over the room talking to everybody. It's uncomfortable <laughs> because I have to come out of myself. But as a 5G, and I'm not talking telephone service, I'm a five-generation church girl. My grand grandmother and great-grandmother were women who worked in the church, and I saw that. My mother worked in the church. I saw that. I raised my children to serve in the church. And so I take that with me wherever I go, uh, whatever I do, whether I'm working in the community, I'm recruiting subjects for the, the documentary, um, Wherever I go, I try to extend myself to my neighbors and extend it with the love of Christ, what Christ has given us. I am so blessed. It would take me all day to tell my testimony, but I'm telling you, I am blessed to be here and so happy to be a part of this. So 
if there's one thing you can remember from today, is to extend ourselves and love unconditionally. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Before I ask uh, Lionel to come forward, I, we ought to really just give an extra thank you to the members of the panel who have come forward and, and uh, shared stories personal and global and community-wide and shared their faith with us of what it means to be Christian, what it means to be a human being. And so I want to thank you all very much. It takes courage to do that. So I thank you, and uh, I ask God to bless you for it. Thank you very much for, for sharing your lives with us. And now Mr. Sosa, the, uh, the artist who developed this uh, exhibit and uh, who's also a San Antonio Peace Laureate, um, ask you to come on up and tell us about this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Will. It really is my privilege uh, to be among all of you, to be among my friends, new friends, old friends, uh, because I had no idea what was going to be coming of this. You know, it was just came from after George Floyd's death. Uh, all of us were at home. Uh, COVID had just started. We were watching television 24-7, and we saw this black man uh, being killed, and it affected all of us. But I never knew to, to what extent it was affecting black men and black women. Black men were feeling that knee on their neck in a way that I could not experience as a Latino, or other people who may not be black men. And the stories that I started hearing were stories that needed to be told because a lot of these men spoke and when they spoke they went beyond telling these stories to their friends and to other black men uh, <clears throat> and as they were speaking to the camera each each person had about an hour to speak and uh, so much emotion came out. Some men told stories that they had never told a white person, but they knew that white people were going to hear the story for the first time. These were stories that were kept in their hearts, in their souls, in their memories. Sometimes stories that they had not told their mother and father, sometimes stories that they had not told their wives. And I know that because several of the men brought their wives with them. And one in particular who was talking and bearing all his emotions, when the interview was over and I looked back at his wife, her makeup was all over her face and tears were flowing. And I knew she was hearing those stories for the first time. So sharing stories is one of the ways to fight racism. And while I had no idea that to what extent these stories could be told, especially in a city like San Antonio that's supposed to be culturally aware, that's uh, two thirds Latino that has had a uh, black woman mayor that has the largest MLK march in the country, you would think that we would be more knowledgeable about race. You would think that we would be more encompassing of everyone, uh, but that's not always the case. I think uh, all of these, every time I have one of these forums, I wish I could record every minute of it, and then are we, there is a recording of this. I'm gonna listen to this so I can hear all of your stories again and make notes of things that all of us need to remember and keep in our hearts and our minds because while all of us think that we are anti-racist, 
we need to sometimes step back and say, are we really, and what are the things that we do unconsciously and unknowingly that might hurt somebody else. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate everything that you're doing to continue this dialogue and continue these stories. Again, thank you, uh, Lyle, uh, and thank you, each one of you on the panel, but thank you to each one of you who is here. Just take a moment of silence right now, if you would. What has been the most significant thing you've heard this morning? Just take a minute. What are you carrying with you as you go out the door? What's going to make a difference that you heard that this morning? And as you know, those of you who can tell time, and have a clock or a watch, or can look at the one on the wall. You know we're <laughs> kind of out of uh, a time, but we want to take time to, if you would briefly just share one significant thing quickly around the table, just real quick around your table, and the one who's exactly my age start. <laughs> Whatever you think that is. <laughs> If you could just go do a round, uh, around the table sharing. What's most significant that you heard this morning? to bring people together. <laughs> I'm going to take note of that. Because back to my statement earlier, for me, anti-racism is rooted in relationships. But we got to be intentional to build those relationships. As I, I know two To go to, uh, why wouldn't you talk to people of any race like you want to be friends? Isn't that the way you start <laughs> a relationship? Rooted in the fear of being wrong, right? Yeah, yeah. That's how you have to enter into these conversations, right? Right. To be corrected. Sure. Yeah, you gotta be vulnerable because, you know, you're not gonna build friendships, relationships, if your defenses are up, you know. So, my rule of thumb is, well, if you say the wrong thing, then be willing to say, I'm so sorry, tell me this. <laughs> Teach me. Teach me. I am a lifelong Baptist. And that's, it's a long life. <laughs> but I work in interfaith settings in the land. And it is such a humbling and rewarding experience all the time. Because, I mean, I'll, I'll give a little most recent testimony. Some trying to work with some relation to prepare for the pandemic. Now, I didn't know it going in, 
but I think in my mind, it's like, oh yes, congregations like my Thank you for taking the time to share uh, that. And usually I ask uh, in my class, and what are you taking with you today, from today? What will you tell somebody you did between seven and nine this morning that was significant? that's gonna impact your world and your life. So I, I hope you had a, at least a beginning an opportunity to uh, crystallize that. But now we, uh, in the interest of time, we would like to move to our next question, which we're gonna ask you to do from the public mic so that everyone can hear you, those being uh, on live stream as well as those in the room. And the question is this, what might we do? Somebody reminded us today that we need to have a, a we conversation rather than just a me or a them conversation. What might we do together that you could contribute to individually as well, but it's we, who we are together with this conversation? in our future? How do we move this conversation into the future? So we invite you to pause a moment. And then if you would, uh, go to the mic to share it with the larger group. I'm gonna do this because I already know what I wanna do. I realized this morning that we were able to pull together a meeting of all these networks, if you really looked at it, right? So I think one of the things that we could do is that within each of those networks, to do exactly the same thing, but invite their entire network. Okay, good one, thank you, thank you. So um, I do believe that we each carry within us um, a living core of love and compassion, and that we each carry within us a light of wisdom and intuition. And I think what we should do is slow down mm -hmm. so we can access those beautiful gifts that we were born into this life with, and there's just so much talk, you know? That's Thank you. And do a, a quick commercial for inviting the prophetic voice into your church. Um, we, the prophetic voice here says, this is who y'all are being, this is who you're made to be, and this is what's going to happen if you don't fix the difference. Um, so inviting uh, this prophetic voice into your church or your, uh, congregation. Or your congregation. Yeah, uh, Sister, sister um, Janine came to our church months ago. Still, her words resonated. She asked this question, how do I parent my children so they don't fall into the abyss? Mm -hmm. And then she answered the question, gave our church language, uh, saying different does not mean deficient. That's How many right. folks in my church have repeated that over these last months? So thank you for the prophetic voice and, 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 and this calling of the church to live in uh, to, um, to listening and responding. So thank you all so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I am a university educator, but I want to speak about education on all levels, university, high school, junior high, on down. I think it's imperative that we deliberately work um, to, for children, for all ages in schools, to have conversations where we can hear each other's stories, where we can become friends. And it doesn't happen automatically. Your teachers really need to deliberately facilitate the structures for listening to each other's stories. Thank you, thank you, great. Tell the story.
My message is somewhat like Anne was in talking about taking the message back to networks. I would challenge us to take them to networks and groups that we find ourselves in that do not give an easy forum for this conversation. <laughs> I am a member of the arts organizations of San Antonio, particularly in the performing arts. And I'm aware that nationally and globally, the arts communities are waking up. And as Adrienne Warren, the woman who portrays Tina Turner in Tina the Musical on Broadway, just won the Tony Award for Best Actress in a Musical, said, the world is screaming for us to change when she accepted her Tony Award. Well, the world is screaming for those of us who have white privilege, a word that, a term we've not mentioned in the room today, but those of us that have inherited and perpetrated white privilege to name it in places where it's not so easy yet to name. And we all find ourselves, many of them are congregations that are largely made up of persons of the same race. But uh, there are other groups that we find ourselves in, in society, in schools, in the theater, where it's not so easy to name white privilege and to be anti-racist. But the world is screaming for us to change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Morning. To me, the story about the two-year-old, three-year-old kids who don't know any of this, how they run at each other, want to play with each other, I think that's the message we want to carry. All of us work with co groups, congregations, we have young kids in our fold. Instead of assuming they won't learn bias, they won't learn discrimination, make the attempt to consciously teach them not to bias, not to discriminate. And it's like muscle memory, right? For us to unlearn and relearn and get back to where we lose all of it is difficult, but as we are bringing them up, if they plant the right seed in the mind, they are going to grow up without all those biases. I think that's an opportunity. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Sir. <laughs> One last word. <laughs> One last word, okay. Powerful gathering. Uh, the, and the power of image, living in my skin, mm -hmm. and the power of word and prose. So then each of our communities is to bring together this multi-dimensional way of communicating a transcending truth in order to create the transformation. Mm. So then each of our communities looking at image and word creating conversation within our communities around bringing this together. So I'm thinking of how we may have exhibits, gatherings, and stories. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Again, in the interest of time and to forward the conversation, I would ask you again to ask yourself, what difference will it make that I have been here today? What difference will it make in the dismantling, the reconfiguring racism? What difference? will it make? What will your feet do? What will your hands do? Well, wh where will you put your body, your witness, your testimony? What difference will it make? How will you move this conversation forward? Scott? Thank you, Eddie Lorraine. This exhibit, 
and this conversation can travel. Lionel's ready to go. Other folks, Pastor John Garland is John. I think John just stepped out. Is he? He just stepped out. Yeah, I saw him here earlier. Okay, John uh, has had it there at uh, at his church, um, and you can speak to him afterwards if you'd like to uh, host something like this on your own. Um, talk to him about the details of how that could happen. I want to thank you all so very much for coming out early this morning for this marvelous conversation, um, the power of image and the power of prose and the power of people and the stories of their lives, um, the things that we learn when we listen to what's, what's happening around us. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, I'm going to ask Sister Addie to pray us out the door. One of my favorite things to do is to pray a prayer song. I'm not going to sing, and y'all will be happy for that today. But I am going to pray the words of a song that for uh, black people who, uh, my age who grew up in black schools and learned the national black <laughs> anthem. Uh, it's really important for us to say. So these words are from that song, and so I ask you to pray with me. As you bow your heads, I pray these words for us. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way. Thou who has by thy might led us into the light. Keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand true to you, our God, true to our native land, true to who you have created us and called us to be. Amen and amen. Let the church say amen. Let the members of the community say amen, amen. amen. May we go in peace.